Hi, my name is Phil. I like talking about politics, and in this video, I'd like to discuss how even conservative supporting media is outraged by the levels of corruption involved in the awarding of government contracts under Boris Johnson's leadership and how it has led to comparisons with the Cash for Question scandal from the 90s. As well as towards the end, for me, a very serious question for the government on what might have been an even longer delay between making the decision to lock down and actually locking down than was initially reported. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification icon. So this weekend, there was a report in The Times, which is a strongly conservative supporting newspaper. It's not a fan of Boris Johnson and his populist agenda, and it's not a fan of Brexit. Um, but they were reporting on the vast sums of public money given to Tory-linked companies, as they call it, uh, for COVID goods and services, without any proper regard for which companies would actually have been able to deliver in the best interests of the public. Now, and again, this is this is part of the the, the fact that they are a, normally a conservative supporting. Well, they are a conservative supporting paper, so they describe the reasons for this as being, and I quote, a mixture of trust, convenience and panicked need to deliver rather than a desire to benefit themselves financially. Now that is a very charitable way of looking at the motivation, I would say. Especially as in this Times report, it also notes that departments have taken an average of 72 days to publish the recipients of this public money. You know, they noted that this means that by the time it's all been made public, the public debate has moved on and the decisions can't really be scrutinised properly. Now, this is applying a very light touch to the situation because although the government's emergency powers do allow them to award contracts without going through the normal tendering processes, it does not, as I have reported before, allow them to keep the details of the contracts under wraps. The law requires the government to publish contracts within 30 days. I've talked about this before. This is why the Good Law Project, for example, is taking the government to court multiple times over all of these contracts which are not been published in time. Many of these contracts that were given out months ago have still not been published to this day. Now, the Times doesn't mention this, doesn't talk about this. And this is sort of what I'm getting at as well. So here we've got a newspaper it supports the Conservatives. And like all British media, it doesn't, it, it gives a light touch to the group that they back, even when they're having to give them a little bit of a telling off. Um, yeah, it doesn't like Boris Johnson, but it still battered for him in the last general election because they will fundamentally always default to support for the Conservatives. So as a result, they're putting the kindest possible spin on this story. And yet, this is still a story that is pointing out the wasteful and corrupt democracy, as they call it, the awarding of contracts to friends as a default position. You know, and when even staunch supporters of the party are comparing it to the cash for questions scandal in the 90s, which also involved conservative MPs, um, the, the idea for those who don't recall or, or don't know, um, MPs were asking questions in Parliament as a result, I mean, it's normal to ask questions in Parliament as a result of lobbying, but they were being paid for it. Uh, it was a bit of a scandal. And uh, the whole thing stank. And it's doing so again. You know, regardless of political leanings, this latest example is, uh, it stinks even worse in many ways. And the report doesn't just talk about the awarding of contracts to friends, though. It also talks about bringing in those friends to the party to, for, for meetings with ministers who then receive large contracts. Now imagine that. So what you've got here is you've got the people who are being awarded the contracts are actually involved in the meetings where ministers are deciding who to award the contracts to. I mean, can you imagine that? You're going around the table, oh, you know, who might be best to award this contract? And then you've got someone there, go, oh, I mean, I could probably do it. You know, I, I, I could do it. Or do you think you can manage to deliver 150 million quids worth of PPE? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it can't be that hard, can it? All right, here you go. I mean, it. it the report talked about, for example, Lord Feldman being an unpaid advisor for the government without telling the public either. 
Because obviously, you know, if the government have advisors where there might be conflicts of interest, there's a lot of people pay attention to government who might be able to go, oh, I think you might have a conflict of interest there. By keeping it secret, again, and again, the times aren't, you know, coming heavy on this, but nonetheless, you just have to think about it for a moment. Why would the government keep an advisor secret if there was nothing to hide, if there was no conflicts of interest? It's because there are, and they wish to keep that suppressed. And... Um, and a large contract went there for, to, to basically went to uh, a company who donated, whose chairman donated a serious amount of money when Fellman was Conservative Party chair. When I say a serious amount of money, as usual, it wasn't a large donation as most people would understand it. It was £63,000 reportedly. And this company was given a £168 million PPE contract which is not a bad return. It never is, never is a bad return. You know, they may, they, as I've said before, there'll be people in America watching this for blimey, it's, it's cheap to, to, to bribe your government, isn't it? Yeah, it is really cheap. And the report contains other similar scenarios of advisors being involved in the awarding of contracts that ends up going to people who, who know them, who are very close to them. The sheer number of times it's happening is beyond the possibility of coincidence, of course. In fact, the links in the report are just the tip of the iceberg. Some people may be familiar with the recent work of Sophie E. Hill, who produced an interactive graphic which shows the links between Conservatives and the companies being awarded these government COVID contracts. She's called it My Little Crony. It was even brought up in Parliament last week. I've put a link in the description below for people who are not familiar with it. Now then we come on to what really is the biggest scandal of the weekend. So Pasco Watson, a, a former Murdoch editor, used to edit the Sun newspaper, very much involved in decisions. Unpaid advisor, very much there. Uh, civil servants even reportedly raised concerns about his involvement. It was not normal at all. Nothing was done at all. And he is reported to have used his access to discussions and briefings to give advance notice of government policy to paying clients. Now, this has caused Labour to demand an investigation into Pasco Watson's role, especially in light of the fact, the most serious thing for me, this is for me the most shocking thing, that he was able to tell paying clients about the lockdown that we're now in the middle of a full week before it was made public. Now, this is very serious for, for two reasons. There's two huge implications here. First of all, is just the standard corruption that I've already been talking about. You know, the government are allowing representatives of lobbyists into the heart of their decision-making process. Will it be any surprise, therefore, that the decisions more often than not come out in the form of lucrative contracts for the companies those lobbyists represent? But then secondly, much more seriously, the notion that clients were given advance notice of the lockdown a full week's notice was extremely serious for a reason other than corruption. The second lockdown in England began on Thursday, the 5th of November. But Boris Johnson formally announced it the previous Saturday um, after the news was leaked the day before. Now, that meant that there was a five day gap between the announcement of the lockdown itself. I said at the time, the number of cases is, is going to rise. We're gonna have a, a higher number of cases there. That's going to result in a great deal more death. So in, if we go by the death rate, which has a lag on it, of course, but just to highlight how the figures look. So in that five days, the, av the average daily death rate increased by 20%. When you're in the, in the middle of a COVID wave, of course, that's how serious a few days delay is in making a decision and implementing a decision. Now, if the reports are correct here, those paying lobbyists were informed a week before the public well, the public was informed on the 31st of October. So that suggests that the government had made the decision to go into lockdown, to be announced to these paying clients at around October the 24th. So if, as I say, the report is true, that means the time between the government deciding to lock down and actually locking down, the death rate didn't just increase by 20%, it actually increased by 86% because there's a whole week of that decision having been made, apparently, that we didn't know about. So why this inexcusable delay then? 
why would you sit on this for a week? You've made the decision. Why would you? And especially if you think about it as well, if they'd have made the decision a week earlier, it would have been not only quicker and therefore more effective, but it would have covered that half term. People were crying out, use the half term. It will mean less economic impact. So it means they made the decision before the half term. So they could have implemented it for the half term and they didn't. So what it actually means is they made the decision and they didn't lock down for nearly two weeks after making that decision. A delay that will certainly have cost lives and also done more harm to the economy. I mean, let's say you don't care about the lives lost. I mean, I'm not dead, you know, but you do care about the business as affected. Well, I've got a business or I care about the economy for some other reason. Now, beyond the, the missing the half term, Keir Starmer pointed out earlier this month that by delaying the lockdown decision, Boris Johnson shifted that lockdown closer to Christmas. Now, what did that do? It means you've got a fair amount of retail closed in the run up to Christmas. And so the busiest time of year for them. You know, and this is why the Pasco Watson case, you know, it might just on first look just seem like yet another corruption case to, case to throw on the pile, which is now so large that there's a danger that people will start ignoring the scandal as it becomes normalised. It just becomes commonplace and people get bored of it and really shouldn't. But, but this one case doesn't just highlight the jobs for boys attitude, which, if we're honest, exists everywhere in politics, although... Boris Johnson is applying an extreme form of it. But it shows that the government deliberately sacrificed lives and the economy, whichever you care about, to give some associates a bit more time to maximise their profits from a bit of inside knowledge. Labour have also asked, in part of the investigation, how these lobbyists and their clients benefited from the information as well. Now that'll be important, because I think we'd all like to know what profit was made? What benefit was given to this small group of lobbyists that made the lives of, of people who succumbed to COVID worth losing as a result of the lockdown delay? Because ordinarily, you know, um, I mean, the government rebuttal, just, you know, throw this in there, what the government said to all this, for those interested, was that, well, it's quite right, unprecedented pandemic, it's quite right that we draw upon expert advice from the private sector. Okay, all right then. See, ordinarily, this advice might work, except, of course, um, in a situation where, as a result of that advice, you spend hundreds of millions of pounds on PPE that either never arrived or did arrive but was the wrong sort and had to be recalled, or you put a serial cock-up merchant in charge of the ultra-crucial test and trace that then, apparently to the surprise of government, was cocked up spectacularly. And then you put in charge of our vaccine rollout operation, a venture capitalist who, by her own admission, knew nothing about vaccines. When she was rung up by Boris Johnson to ask her to head it all up, she said, I, I don't know anything about vaccines. Oh, that's fine. You'll be fine. I'm sure we're all looking forward to the professional way in which the vaccine is rolled out across the UK next year as well. But those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. Hope you found the video interesting. If you did, don't forget to click the like button. And if you'd like to support the channel further, please also click the Patreon link for details. And until next time, I'll see you later.